are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kendall Trump with Grain Journal Magazine, Indicator, Illinois. Welcome to Sowing the Wild Oats, an oral history of the southern Louisiana grain processing processing industry. This is the first in a series of webinars to be presented by Jeeps and Grain Journal Magazine in 2019. Work in the grain industry carries a great amount of risk, yet for many, grain is essentially their lifeblood, inherited from their agricultural ancestors. Utilizing oral history reviews, our presenter today will examine the changes and developments in the grain industry in southern Louisiana since the 1970s. We do hope to see you at the Jeeps Exchange 2019, which will be held March 9th through 12th in New Orleans, Louisiana. Our webinar today is sponsored by M&M Specialty Services. M&M specializes in protecting your people and your products with the best in quality and affordability in personal protection products, grain protectants, fumigants, and services. They are based in Leavenworth, Kansas. Our webinar is also sponsored by VAA LLC, who has provided engineering and design services in the agribusiness industry since its founding in 1978. Working with owners, equipment vendors, and design-build contractors, the firm specializes in bulk commodity handling facilities, including slip form design, material handling, transportation, and export. They are based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our presenter today is Chandler Taylor. Chandler is pursuing both a Master's of Art and History and a Master of Library and in Information Science and Archival Studies. She has spent the last two and a half years working as a, the graduate assistant interviewer and finding aid creator for the T. Harry Williams Center for Oral History. Her grandfather, John Beach, worked as elevator superintendent for the New Orleans Public Grain Elevator in the 1970s. He also served as Jeeves' international president from 1979 through 1980. Chandler's goal is to document the stories of the grain industry for the benefit of future researchers. Please feel free to ask questions today by typing them into the questions box at the right-hand side of your screen at any time during our webinar. We will be answering your questions during a Q&A session following our presentation. We do have a quick polling question for you today. How many people are viewing at your location? Thank you for your participation. As a note, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our website, grainnet.com, within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email with a link to our recording and the presentation slides. Chandler, at this time, can you please do a voice check? Um, good morning. Good morning, we can hear you perfectly. <laughs> and now, can you show us your screen? Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here is Chandler Taylor. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you're having a great Wednesday. Um, so over the last year and a half, I have been building an oral history collection documenting Louisiana's grain history from the 1970s to the present. This presentation seeks to expand on the information I've gathered from those interviews by tracing the full history of Louisiana grain from the 18th century through the 20th century. Um, the presentation couldn't accommodate audio, so in order to showcase the oral history work that has been done, I have put together a website with clips from the interviews and an expansion of the research I will be discussing today, which I believe will be sent out in a later email as well. Um, so the website itself is louisianagrainhistory.com. Um, on the homepage of the site, there's a little bit of information about me and the project. I'm primarily an entertainment historian. That's what I have two previous degrees in. 
Um, so this agricultural history project is a bit far afield for me. But as Kendall mentioned, uh, my grandfather spent much of his career in the grain elevators of Louisiana, and I was thoroughly inspired by him to start working on this project. I grew up hearing stories about his time with Jeeps, and it was a family oral history project that really served as the catalyst for this current project. And it has certainly been a real joy getting to explore something so personal, yet so global in scale. So there's a history page on the site, um, which features a brief history of the grain industry in Louisiana, from its origins in rice in the 1700s through the late 1900s. And with in that, there is a timeline page for those who don't want to sift through all of the thick text that I will be writing for the history page. The website is a work in progress at the moment. Um, then we have the speakers, um, and these are 12 of the individuals who have been kind enough to share their stories with me. Um, some people were not included on the site simply because they don't have a photo to go with their interview or their audio had some problems, but I do want to thank everyone who participated in um, these interviews, even if they don't have a clip on the site, because they're all a part of this history. So each speaker has an individual page with a clip, and as an example, this is my good friend um, Eric Broussard. He has familial connections to the rice industry in southwest Louisiana. And his interview talks about how his family lost control of the rice dryer in Lake Arthur. And it became a family legend of romance and theft that was passed down for two, two generations. And through this project, we were able to debunk that legend. So finally, there is a page for project updates where I will post information about conference presentations I'm doing or new content I have finished. The project is also active on social media. These are the various accounts, and the little guy in the corner is the project mascot, Colonel Flanders. Um, so if you want to contribute to the project but can't do it in an interview capacity because you don't live in Louisiana or what have you, um, these are some of the avenues of participation that you can use. Um, or if you just want to stay up to date on how the project's going, um, these are useful for that as well. All right, so two disclaimers about today's presentation. Uh, um, number one, there are some topics within the greater history of the Louisiana grain industry that are not the most positive, but in order to understand how we got to where we are now, we cannot ignore that these things happened. Therefore, I'm not going to shy away from these things that may seem controversial. And two, I'm a historian, and much of my research comes from newspaper coverage over the last two centuries, which creates really an outsider's perspective. So if anything I mentioned related to the inner workings of grain elevators, like terminology or design, what have you, is wrong, just send me a comment. Um, you guys are the experts on what goes on in the elevators, not me. Um, but I'm very excited to have been asked to do this webinar today because this is my master's thesis project in a condensed version. Um, so this is an incredible opportunity to get feedback from experts like yourselves on elements of the industry's functions that are not clearly explained in newspaper coverage or historical texts that I have. All right, so today's presentation seeks to answer the question of what makes the grain industry significant or unique to Louisiana. To begin with, there are really two grain industries in the state, the processing and export of wheat, corn, soybeans, etc., and the cultivation of rice. This means the grain industry has had a presence in Louisiana for approximately 400 years. The most common answer about Louisiana's significance that I've gotten in my oral history interviews is the centrality of the Mississippi River and the Port of New Orleans. When I began working on this project in 2017, we thought the only major connection between the grain industry and Louisiana history was, in fact, the port. But it turns out there's far more to this grain history. Um, but I think we'll begin with just some notes on the port. So it's been argued that the Port of New Orleans was so important to agricultural trade that it was a major factor in facilitating the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Large supplies of grain from the Ohio Valley were not being, that were not being handled by Illinois or Indiana were being sent to market in New Orleans, which W.F. Galpin contends was one of the reasons for the Louisiana Purchase to grant the United States full access to the Mississippi River and the almighty port of New Orleans. 
Certainly the port put Louisiana in a unique position for export. And for nearly a decade following the purchase, American wheat and flour were in great demand in England and the West Indies, and surplus grain from the Ohio Valley found its way to New Orleans and onto these hungry markets. Even prior to the purchase, flour and grain from New Orleans had been sent to the West Indies, Central America, and East Florida. By 1920, New Orleans was the second busiest commerce port behind New York, with an import and export business amounting to a billion dollars. Continuously throughout the early 20th century, the port set new records for grain export, notably in 1928, 1946, and 1955. In 1955, when the public grain elevator handled its billionth bushel of grain, noted by the press to be Iowa corn, youth 4-H leaders and government officials were present as it was an exceptional landmark for the port. In 1953, the port was even highlighted in an episode of the March of Time. As mentioned previously, the history of the Louisiana grain industry simultaneously represents two industries, the processing and export side linked to the port and the cultivation of rice in the Southwest. Coincidentally, the New Orleans export industry grew out of the rice industry that once dominated the city. Since rice came to the lowlands of Louisiana, the grain industry has been anything but immune to controversy, scandal, and crisis. According to Armando A. Callea and others tracing Louisiana's history to the 18th century colonization by Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne de Bienville, Rice was introduced to the Louisiana landscape as early as 1718. In the early years, the Louisiana rice industry was clustered around New Orleans, with Plaquemine Parish harvesting the most. This rice was primarily a subsistence crop for the farmers cultivating it, as there was no real market to speak of for this essentially experimental grain. By the mid-19th century, New Orleans had become the leading grain export center in the United States. According to Lawson P. Babineau, Jr., the city had the fourth largest population in the country in 1851, and a good portion of those people were trying their hands at rice farming. The area had experienced a boom to its population in the preceding decades as the railroad continued moving westward. Farmers from the Midwest brought their expertise in cultivating wheat, oats, and barley to southwest Louisiana and commented that the prairie land there resembled closely the farmland from which they came, allowing them to easily reorient to the new crop. By 1857, Babineau Jr. notes, the first railroad line west of New Orleans was completed, reaching Berwick Bay, a small shipping center located some 100 miles from New Orleans. This new rail line allowed grain cultivation to move further from the New Orleans hub, but farmers were still married to the city for the marketing of their grain because there were no warehouses for storage in southwest Louisiana, so rice had to be shipped to New Orleans immediately after harvesting for milling. Even farmers outside Louisiana looking to make use of the port were compelled to travel down the river alongside their produce to dispose of their goods personally. This placed a burden on the industry as a whole because it created a gap in production where the land sat idle while the farmers embarked on their marketing expeditions. There were additional obstacles once they reached New Orleans in that there was an inadequate supply of storage facilities. In the first half of the 19th century, the city's grain market relied on the use of simple warehouses that were located a considerable distance from the wharves. Grain could easily be damaged in the trek from the storage warehouses to the wharf marketplace or by exposure to New Orleans' temperamental weather. Deterioration or damage of any kind, as is the case today, dramatically affects the price a seller can get for their grain. Out of the barter system in which the individual farmer served as both producer and salesman came the forwarding and commission merchant business. As described by John G. Clark, this system, much like the country grain elevators of today, handled grain for both farmers and merchants, provided storage facilities, found the most efficient transportation, and endeavored to sell at the nearest market. Agricultural practice throughout the North and Midwest had been refined and expanded during the first half of the 19th century, and it is clear that the existing systems of marketing and storage in New Orleans were certainly not up to the task of facilitating large-scale grain movement. This is why the construction of grain elevators around New Orleans can be seen beginning as early as 1873 with an elevator in West Wego. The Times-Picayune suggests an even earlier elevator construction with an article published on February 4th, 1868, announcing plans for an elevator in the Algiers area of New Orleans. However, Babineau Jr. maintains that New Orleans was the only site for rice milling in the state by 1880. By the end of the century, Louisiana was the leading producer of rice in the United States. In 
1892, a new record was set in New Orleans with 200 million pounds of rough rice shipped to the city for milling and marketing. Despite this record shipment, a demand was growing throughout the southwestern prairies for the rice farmers to have more control over the milling and marketing of their crop. In the first years of the 1890s, these farmers started constructing milling facilities closer to their farms to directly challenge the dominance of New Orleans. There had been no fewer than eight mills in New Orleans by the 1890s. The marketing system at these mills was done on a toll basis and saw the rice placed up for bid by rice dealers. According to Babineau Jr., these men acted as distributors to wholesale and retail markets. For the farmers, this system resulted in a multitude of unknowns regarding the price their rice would fetch. Because the milling and marketing practices in New Orleans were wildly unregulated, the sale of the rice was subject to excess fluctuation, leading to charges of monopolization and price speculation from the farmers. In February 1892, an unknown corporation formed a trust in New Orleans that brought almost all of the city's rice mills together under one umbrella. A few days after the trust was formed, only three or four of the 13 mills in the city were still open for business, leaving hundreds of people suddenly without employment. The farmers responded by campaigning for corrective legislation to challenge the city's monopoly, taking their business to smaller country elevators, and building their own mills to drive business out of New Orleans. By the turn of the 20th century, there were 10 mills in Acadia Parish alone. The lackluster practices of the New Orleans industry were somewhat challenged in 1894 with the introduction of rice inspectors. But the cost of this inspection was simply an additional financial burden to the farmers, perhaps a sort of retaliation punishment for their challenge to New Orleans market dominance. This new inspection also created opportunities for waste and theft, as it was certainly designed on a sampling system that judged large quantities of rice from a small portion. It also put a lot of trust in these outside agents. While it is unclear who was responsible for the appointment of the inspectors, transferring the cost of the work to the farmer was one way the millers benefited from their presence. It is not surprising, therefore, that the farmers were not pleased with the deals they were getting from New Orleans. Their efforts to move the industry closer to the sites of production effectively removed rice from the grain market of New Orleans, allowing wheat, corn, and soybeans to become the major crops of the New Orleans grain elevators. The first grain elevator in West Wego was announced in the Louisiana Review in 1892, but some reports suggest one was being built by the Texas and Pacific Railway sometime in 1873. Prior to its construction, the Times-Picayune noted, the railway grain trade of New Orleans had been dependent altogether on the single small elevator at Southport and the superannuated structure on the River District in the upper portion of the 4th District suggesting a facility in West Wego was a much needed addition to the growing grain industry of New Orleans. Other grain facilities, of course, were present in the area, but they were primarily used for milling rice. Despite its place at the forefront of Louisiana's grain industry, it does seem that West Wego was not blessed with the greatest of luck for its facilities. In February 1916 and again in 1917, rats were trapped at the elevator that tested positive for the plague. A sailor drowned in September 1897 after falling from a ship docked at the elevator, and his body was not recovered for a week. In 1893, the elevator experienced a small fire sparked by a hot journal. The elevator had what seems to be an advanced sprinkler system that quickly suppressed the fire and prevented it from thoroughly damaging the building. In March 1894, the elevator suffered a fairly major setback when its main conveyor was separated from the building by a heavy windstorm. In August 1904, after an expansion to the elevator was completed, 400 feet of the elevator's grain conveyor again suffered damage when it toppled over as a result of the action of the Mississippi River. Perhaps it was for good reason that the elevator was abruptly demolished in 1926, and a new facility did not take its place until the early 60s when Continental built their infamous elevator. The public grain elevator in New Orleans was opened on February 1, 1917. So we are, as of today, only about a month shy of the centennial plus two milestone. This elevator was called the King in the Land of Grain by at least one newspaper and played a central role in transforming the grain industry into what it is today. The elevator was owned by the state and operated by the Board of Commissioners of the Port of New Orleans. Prior to the construction of the Industrial Canal in the early 1920s, Louisiana law inherited from the Spanish and French regimes indicated that river frontage could not be sold or leased to private enterprise, 
preventing port facilities from being sewed up by selfish interests and ensuring a fair deal for all shipping lines, new ones as well as old, with a consequent development of foreign trade. This explains why much of Louisiana's grain industry in the early 20th century was aided by public utilities. The public grain elevator was one of three commodity handling facilities initially controlled by the state. The others were the public cotton warehouse and the public coal handling plant. All three were constructed in close proximity to each other on the riverfront. This image from 1919 shows the cotton warehouse from the roof of the public grain elevator. And this is an alternate view showing both the public grain elevator and the cotton warehouse. Um, construction of the public grain elevator began on October 9th, 1915. Designed after a model pioneered in Seattle, the elevator was operated by public employees who served on the Board of Commissioners of the Port of New Orleans. Several things make the elevator unique. Um, number one, the facility was designed to be functional, yet aesthetically pleasing. And two, it had the latest and greatest technology for all aspects of safety. The American Elevator and Grain Trade commented in April 1928 in the early spring, when a visitor sees the beds of violets and roses throughout the area, he immediately remarks on the contrast between appearances at this elevator and the carelessly cluttered up yards typical of some grain handling plants. But frequently, he is much more surprised at the happy songs of canaries whose cages swing above the flower beds on the wide veranda of the main office building. The canaries are used almost every day in the year for the purpose of detecting gases in the deep storage bins and were introduced at this plant several years ago because an employee engaged in cleaning one of the bins lost his life as a result of poisonous gases. The 1922, board, the 1922 report of the Board of Commissioners of the Port of New Orleans praises the impressive safety conditions of the facility, but even the elevator's up-to-date equipment, canaries, and absolutely fireproof status was not enough to eliminate the unpredictability of grain dust and its propensity to explode. In April 1938, five men were killed and 11 were injured at the elevator in a dust explosion that caused $28,000 in damages. In 1953, a second structure was added to the elevator at a cost of $7 million. At the dedication ceremony for the elevator addition, A.C. Koch, president of the New Orleans Board of Trade, commented that the Board of Trade was the first to recognize the necessity for an export grain elevator, as well as to see the danger of a privately operated elevator. According to Koch, since its inception, the Board of Trade had sought to protect both buyers and sellers of grain and other commodities through standardization of grades and other factors bearing on quality and price. It is argued that the decision to make the public it is argued that the decision made at the public grain elevator in 1929 to shift the responsibility for weighing and inspecting grain to elevator employees as opposed to members of the Board of Trade Grain Department as a cost-saving measure created an environment for scandal that was not uncovered or addressed until the 1970s. Sadly, this elevator was demolished in 1989. Oops, here's another picture of it. Um, so Bart Bauer here says, when I started working at Zeno Grain in Convent, Louisiana in 1982, we were loading Russian ships for several years. I can remember that too because they're usually the biggest ships and they always have the hammer and scythe insignia on the smokestack of the ships. So I always knew it was a Russian vessel. And so for several years we did load grain going to Russia. Then all of a sudden it just kind of quit. I don't know if this is one of the main reasons, but I had heard that I think the United States was, and I'm not sure this is completely true, but subsidizing grain to Russia because the Russians would take the grain and their people were not doing so well. And then somehow, if I remember right, there's some story about how the grain got to the ports of Russia and then it would just sit there and there was no infrastructure to get it inland to the people and the grain rotted on the docks. And so eventually America just quit doing it. There's probably more to that story, you know, politically, or who knows. This is such a great quote from Mr. Bauer. And indeed, there is a lot more or a lot about this deal with the Soviet Union that is unknown, um, particularly to those outside the grain industry. My research indicates that it was one of the major turning points for the industry in the 20th century, precisely because of the subsidizing scheme. Here we're jumping to 1972 from the public grain elevator, but it will all make sense. Um, it's very complicated to understand and explain, and there are three excellent books on this deal 
that I would recommend. Um, the Great American Grain Robbery and Other Stories by Martha McNeil Hamilton. The Great Grain Robbery by James Traeger and U.S. Grain Exports, Russian Buyers, and Short Supplies, 1971 to 1975 by Joseph G. Gavin III. For now, we can just look at the basics of what I'm calling hashtag secret wheat um, and how it affected Louisiana grain. I call this um, deal hashtag secret wheat uh, because the massive sales agreements were all made in private meetings between Soviet officials and executives of the grain companies. The U.S. government was not made aware of the scale of the sales until they were far too big to contend with. In the summer of 1972, Soviet government officials met behind closed doors in New York with executives of a few U.S. grain companies. There was some indication of activity with the Soviet Union, but the details remained sparse for a significant amount of time. In mid-July, the Southwestern Miller, an industry paper, could only report that heavy futures activity and ship chartering confirmed mammoth but as yet unconfirmed sales of wheat and other grains to the USSR. No consensus was yet apparent on indicated sales total or breakdown, but many felt that size would be unprecedented. On July 18th, the paper published a guarded guess that the Soviets might possibly have purchased 100 million bushels of U.S. wheat. Barney Saunders of Cargill, acting on rumors of the size of Russia's demand for wheat, had a study prepared of an apparent maximum of hard red winter wheat available for extraordinary demand, such as Russian exports. This study, drawing on published USDA data, was finished by the end of July and was brought to the New York meeting between Cargill and the Soviets as part of their negotiation arsenal. All of the New York meetings had generated a sale of at least $750 million of American wheat, corn, and other grains to the Soviet Union. The U.S. companies involved, eager to secure such business, had sold wheat they did not own. According to James Traeger, each was engaged in the delicate process of trying to acquire wheat without disturbing the precarious price balance of the market. No company knew how much wheat any other company had sold the Russians, and none knew the total amount of the Soviet purchase. The sale was a result of a bad domestic harvest of wheat in the Soviet Union. Continental had, in fact, sold at least 5.5 million tons, Louis Dreyfus 2.25 million, Cargill 2 million, Cook 900,000, Bungie 600,000, and Garnack 550,000. According to Trigger, in less than six weeks, Soviets had purchased, or Soviet purchases had extended the $1 billion, pardon me, Soviet purchases had exceeded the $1 billion figure the USDA had projected for a full year's purchases. Agriculture Secretary Earl Butts told a subcommittee in September 1972 that nobody knew then, neither the Department of Agriculture nor the trade, just how much the Russians would buy. The export traders were not telling each other how much the Soviets were booking with them. Exporters did not tell the Department of Agriculture. The sale was supported by subsidies from the U.S. government that averaged less than 30 cents a bushel. It was the astonishing size of the Soviet purchases that created a problem for the U.S. taxpayer because they would be paying roughly $132 million for the Russian wheat plus an additional $180 million towards grain shipments to other locales. In early July, that only amounted to a few cents per bushel, but by late August 1972, the export subsidy had climbed to 38 cents per bushel. Unfortunately, even that was not enough to maintain the target price of $1.63 per bushel because wheat was now selling for $2.11 a bushel. Regardless of the monetary implications of this game of wheat exchange, the real crisis arose from the short supply Continental and the other companies encountered, raising questions of U.S. supplies that existed on paper but failed to materialize. Traeger notes some country elevator operators who had not bought wheat futures to hedge their sales to exporters were forced into bankruptcy and thus reneged on contracts they had made with the exporters. Foreign buyers had ordered twice as much of the remaining 1972 soybean crop as the agriculture department considered available for export, meaning the exporters had sold more soybeans than there were to sell. And even before the first bushel of the new wheat crop was harvested, Nearly 38% of that crop, 18 million tons, had been sold for export, including 2.5 million to mainland China. Some dock workers tried to stop the deal by boycotting the loading of ships bound for the Soviet Union. Some sales were made in 1971, with Continental signing their first contracts with the Soviets in July. 
Michelle Freiborg, the head of Continental, was an idealist, as Treger sees it, and in the early 1970s had a burning, selfless desire to cement East-West political relations through increased trade relations. Since the company's first sales to the Soviet Union in 1963, Freiborg had been on a first-name basis with Moscow's grain buyers, paving the way for their grand deal a decade later. According to Treger, the leader of the Soviet buying group in 1972 led the continental people to believe he was buying grain only from them. He cautioned everyone at the meeting on the need for absolute secrecy. This massive 1972 deal was made entirely in secret between representatives of the Soviet government and executives of the U.S. grain companies. At this time, numerous USDA officials resigned from their posts to take jobs at the big grain companies. Clarence Palmby, who was Assistant Secretary of Agriculture for Foreign Trade and Commodity Programs under President Nixon and served in that role until 1973, left that job to become Corporate Vice President for Marketing, Planning, and Development at Continental, the very company who had initiated grain sales to the Soviet Union in 1963. Palmby additionally went to work for the U.S. Feed Grain Council following his exit from the government. One president of the council during Palmby's tenure was Samuel Sabin, a vice president of Continental. The two men that followed Palmby at the USDA, Earl Butts and Carol Brontaver, came from Ralston Purina, later owned by Cargill, and Cook Industries, respectively. At the same time, Martha Hamilton points out the two former grain trade officers had moved over to the USDA, and one of the four firms, Bungie, had recently picked up a fifth USDA official, the Export Marketing Service's retiring Chief Administrator, Clifford Polremacher. Senator George McGovern had come out with a charge that the cozy relationship between the USDA and companies such as Continental, as illustrated by the job jumping of men like Clarence Palmby, had somehow enabled the export companies to reap windfall profits from the Soviet sales. Traeger maintains no scandal was ever substantiated and a Justice Department investigation found no criminal wrongdoing on the part either of a government employee, past or present, or of a grain company executive. The world of big grain is really designed around secrecy, which is understandable given the proprietary knowledge each company has. According to Hamilton, the grain trade leadership is a closed-mouthed bunch. With fewer than 500 stockholders and no desire to sell stocks publicly, the companies need not report to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. SEC requirements provide for reporting only basic corporate financial data and information on types of diversification and areas of growth. Con Cargill, Continental, Bungie, and Dreyfus did not have to reveal even this much. The men at the helm of these companies, according to Traeger, were allowed, in effect, to determine U.S. foreign and economic policy. Traeger explains how this generated several mini-scandals in the aftermath of the sale. The CEA, Commodity Exchange Authority, the USDA agency responsible for regulating the futures markets. Um, according, to journal, but according to journalists, the authority has largely relied on, <laughs> let me reread that, the CEA, Commodity Exchange Authority, the USDA agency responsible for regulating the futures market, has largely relied on the professional traders to police themselves. Regulation, they said, actually declined in the years from 1965 to 1972, a period in which the volume of commodity trading zoomed from $65 billion a year to more than $200 billion. A group of grain traders was alleged to have rigged wheat futures on the Kansas City Board of Trade in 1972 in order to drive up the export subsidy. The CEA referred the charges to the Kansas City Board itself, and the board's investigation committees made up of influential board members, including some Continental Grain Company officials, declared there was no basis for complaint. Congressman Neil Smith pointed out that just four traders on one day in the summer of 1973 had held more than 90% of all soybean futures. Such accusations and revelations, including confessions a year after the fact of grossly inaccurate reports filed by Continental, Garnack, and others with the CEA, with most of the charges arising out of the rush of activity in the grain market following the Russian wheat deals, led in 1974 to new federal legislation to overhaul the nation's commodity exchange law. In January 1972, the Commodity Credit Corporation had been ordered to dispose of all grain stocks except for small quantities for emergency reserves. As a result of this order, Traeger says, farmers with bins full of wheat, some had 40,000 to 60,000 bushels in storage, loaded up their trucks and converged on country grain elevators. 
but grain elevators throughout the wheat belts were backed up with wheat they were unable to move for lack of rail cars. Strikes at the ports had tied up rail cars that could not be unloaded because ships were not being loaded. At the same time, it started to become evident that even all of this grain brought out of storage was not enough to cover the extreme size of the contracted sales. There was suspicion in the air that somehow grain theft was occurring on the docks of New Orleans. The FBI began investigating such information, thinking physical theft was at the heart of the issue. However, investigation quickly revealed um, that it was bigger than simply stealing bags of grain. A key witness who became dubbed the Crawfish Man revealed patterns of widespread misgrading of grain, fraudulent grain sales, and bribery in elevators in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Texas. A total of 97 individuals and 17 corporations were convicted in the case, the largest FBI case in history at the time. Out of this investigation came new calls for government oversight of inspection, and the Federal Grain Inspection Service was created. This board, sitting in my office, attempts to trace this large case. As you can see from the various colors, there were at least five strands of investigation, and it all begins in 1929 with the privatization of inspection at the public grain elevator. Several writers have dubbed the 1972 Soviet wheat deal the Great Grain Robbery, so I have given this, this historical moment the title of the Serial Heist of 1975. Um, Ricky Creed here says, private inspection was pretty much entrenched in the export industry for a lot of years. And then they had some governmental changes that occurred in the late 70s that required the Federal Grain Inspection Service to supervise at the beginning. And then typically in a two or three year period, they took over all exported grain in the country. So they had to be there and it kind of minimized the role of the inspection companies, private inspection companies. As Mr. Creed indicates here, private inspection was a basic part of industry practice. We can trace the origins of this system again to the New Orleans Public Grain Elevator in 1929 when the decision was made to privatize inspection as a cost-saving measure. This certainly created an environment that fed off the general existence of secrecy that the grain industry so enjoyed. As another of my interviewees posited, theft within the elevators began at this moment and then as new generations of employees entered the elevator, they saw that this was the way things were done, taking a bit of grain for the companies as each shipment was unloaded. Up until the 1960s, really, the theft occurring in the industry was not exactly stealing, as it was more of a game of statistics. But by the 1970s, the records show that there were multiple avenues of theft being utilized. Fictitious sales and rerouting of shipments were basic, <laughs> that basically resulted in an elevator buying the same grain twice were just two of those schemes. The cereal heist is a major moment in both the Louisiana and the United States grain industries because it was the catalyst for the creation of the Federal Grain Inspection Service, as Mr. Creed rightly noted. Even prior to the introduction of the FGIS, a 1962 article in the Morning Advocate notes, before any shipment of grain is accepted, United States Department of Agriculture employees and elevator employees run an identical sample checks on the grain for grade and condition. In the 1930s, it was noted in the press that all weighing was done by licensed weighers and warehouse receipts were issued by the elevator based on these weights, something that was easy to manipulate. In 1953, the president of the New Orleans Board of Trade said since its inception, the Board of Trade has sought to protect both buyers and sellers of grain and other commodities through standardization of grades and other factors bearing on quality and price. The Town Talk of Alexandria also wrote in 1953 that the Port of New Orleans was second only to New York in dollar value of cargoes and rated first by shipping men in honesty and efficiency. It is significant, therefore, to note that the earliest incident related to what would become the heist investigation happened in January 1953, when an investigation was opened into controversial mixing of unfit Canadian wheat at public grain elevators in New Orleans and Houston. C.J. Winters, the superintendent of the New Orleans Public Grain Elevator, admitted to receiving $36,000 for the blending and for supplying information about grain stocks and storage. Winters resigned a few months after the investigation opened, citing personal reasons. He was indicted in March 1954, but that indictment was dismissed in February 1955. Early in 1952, an investigation was opened into storage 
into shortages in the Agriculture Department's grain storage program in Texas, where losses amounted to $3,800,000. Charles Brannon, the Secretary of Agriculture, testified that no government employees were involved, but rather it was the private warehouse operators who took government-owned grain for their own use. It is incredible to me that with all of this documentation and all of these prior incidents, the heist was not uncovered until the mid-1970s. The basic fraud schemes within the heist relied on the inspectors, and the decades of privatization had worked in their favor because no one was checking over their work, allowing them to easily manipulate reports and be manipulated themselves. As with the 1953 investigation, delivering an inferior product to the customer became a central scheme throughout the 1960s and 1970s. In 1962, the Morning Advocate asked, how does the public grain elevator keep tabs on such a vast and fluctuating commodity? The answer? In a small room near the front of the elevator on the riverside, a group of employees constantly chalk data onto a blackboard mock-up of each silo. This data includes temperatures, grain types, grade numbers, and other technical information written into circles representing each silo. By the early 1960s, we can see the beginnings of orchestrated schemes of theft and short weighing at various elevators in Louisiana and Texas. There are also calls for the USDA to begin investigating some of the companies in the area, but those calls went unheeded. Some European customers even lodged complaints with the US government about inferior shipments, and in December 1968, Japan suspended US wheat purchases due to a quality issue. It is believed that in the short weighing, that in short weighing international shipments and misgrading the product, elevator employees were tricking the scales and skimming grain from deliveries. The stolen grain was then stored elsewhere in the elevator to be sold again at a later date. Additionally, barges would arrive at the elevator and the tugboat captain would be bribed to move the barge to a salvage elevator where the grain was unloaded onto trucks that then took it to sell at the original elevator, resulting in the elevator buying the grain twice. It is my belief that these various schemes would have gone largely undetected had the hashtag secret wheat deals of the early 1970s not happened. Because when the various companies went to deliver on the grain amounts they had agreed to, the grain was there on paper but nowhere to be found in the elevators, raising questions of where the grain had gone. Interestingly enough, in July 1975, an investigation was opened into the USDA's behavior toward the suspicious grain activity in 1972 surrounding the Great Grain Robbery. The times Picayune argued that some agriculture department officials succumbed to industry pressure in the past and falsely upgraded low-quality grain for sale to foreign countries. In a story from The Advocate, it was stated that the corruption of 1975 flowed from the rising stakes in the grain export trade since 1972, when Soviet purchases and a surge in foreign demand caused exports to boom. There's, a, there's an extra little article about it. All right. Um, so for individuals outside the industry, like my classmates, it is surprising to learn that working at a grain elevator for much of their existence had the same daily uncertainty regarding danger as working in a coal mine. The Times Picayune wrote in January 1915 that the same care employed to prevent coal dust explosions should be applied to guard against grain dust blasts. The article went on to quote a mine expert who commented, the grain elevators of the country are at all times subject to the possibility of an explosion if favorable conditions exist. It was common knowledge in the industry from the earliest years that grain dust is highly combustible. In 1926, W.A. Knoll and Ralph Hellbach, two chemical engineers for the USDA, used this knowledge of combustibility to develop a Ford engine that could run on grain dust. The only drawback was that the dust had to be fed manually to the intake valve, but otherwise it worked. The Times Picayune noted in 1937 that the public grain elevator was built of reinforced concrete and was absolutely fireproof. Dust accumulation was made impossible by a dust collection system supplemented by compressed air. In April of the following year, four men died and many others were injured in an explosion at the elevator. The blast was believed to have been caused by spontaneous combustion of, grain, of the grain dust, but it shows that the dust nuisance had not been completely eliminated as the American elevator and grain trade had optimistically written in 1917. In an unfortunate sequence of events, the Bungie grain elevator in Destrehan experienced a minor explosion on September 23, 1970 that resulted in the death of one man. 
and on October 10th, that same elevator exploded again, injuring three people. When the Continental Elevator was built in the 1960s, it was a reinforced concrete structure, as concrete had become the primary material used for all terminal elevators, no matter their location. For nearly 50 years, advertisements had proclaimed that concrete elevators were built to last, or more simply, built for keeps, and their fireproof nature was always at the center of any praise. Concrete was certainly fireproof in the sense of containing a blaze and preventing it from spreading. But that was exactly the problem on the morning of December 23, 1977. The Continental Grain Elevator explosion was the most deadly in the country, and two days before Christmas. The elevator was constructed in a way that added to the severity of the explosion and subsequent damage, as the facility was stacked with the control room above the conveyors and silos. When the blast occurred, it triggered another in an adjacent area of the elevator, and structural support collapsed. This explosion was a wake-up call for the industry. The true cause of the explosion still remains a mystery. As Tim Duncan says here, it spurred a lot of design changes. It was an older design that utilized a headhouse design and bucket elevators, which are since you try to get it if you have the real estate, you try not to do that. You try to get the product elevated using more conventional belt conveyors rather than bucket elevators if you can. Bucket elevators had a reputation of just a potential for problems with either fire or burned out bearings or whatnot that in this particular case, the spark or something can be carried from silo to silo to silo to silo. Boom, 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 boom. Part of the legacy of the West Wego explosion, as Mr. Duncan notes here, is the changes to elevator design. Research into grain dust explosions have been going on since the early 20th century, but elevator designs remained relatively the same until this catastrophic moment. The public grain elevator in New Orleans was continuously praised in the trade press for its concrete construction despite the explosion there in 1938. While a strong construction material, it can certainly be argued that the concrete proved the fatal ingredient in, this, in the 1977 explosion because of its strength and heft. The compact nature of these elevators was also a key to the disaster because the explosion itself really had nowhere to go. This exchange that I'm not going to read um, with Miss Clara Beach was meant to delve into the serial heist of 1975 in which her husband, John Beach, was investigated. But she raises an interesting point in that the FBI did open an investigation into the Continental Explosion in 1977. In several ways, the Continental Explosion was directly linked to the 1975 investigation. In April 1976, the company had paid a $500,000 fine for short wing ships, and most of the inspectors killed or injured in the 1977 explosion were graduates of a special school which was born of the grain scandals. The FBI investigation of the explosion proved inconclusive, raising questions of whether the explosion was a result of dust combustion, terrorism, or sabotage. Val Cantu, an elevator employee, told the town talk that the elevator had been on the receiving end of multiple bomb threats beginning in 1975. When they had a bomb scare, Cantu was quoted as saying, people wanted to knock off work. Then the company decided they were going to put their foot down on people taking off when bomb threats were made. Not even a week before the explosion, they had a meeting and said they were going to take disciplinary action. The following week, boom. I think the bomber made this threat good. I really believe that. Louisiana Agriculture Commissioner Gil Dozier countered Cantu's belief, saying, there is a theory that sabotage was involved because of the farmer strike or the longshoreman strike or the fact that grain inspection has been moved from the private sector to the federal sector. Some people believe that human wrongdoing was involved, but I discount the wrongdoing. I don't believe they will find there was an attempt to harm the elevators. It was reported that Dozier was aware of the bomb threats, but determined that from the nature of the explosion, a gas buildup was the most likely cause. Ultimately, the cause could best be reduced to negligence of some kind, whether in the form of improper housekeeping practices or discounting the bomb threats. So what makes the grain industry significant or unique to Louisiana? I would change that question. Oops, my bad. I would change that question to instead ask what makes Louisiana significant or unique to the grain industry. Through my research, I would say that Louisiana's significance to the grain industry is a product of what I have called its legacies of risk and vice. 
we have seen how the environment within the Louisiana elevators was always ripe for controversy, and even in the rice mills of the 19th century, theft was not uncommon. The FBI investigation of 1975 could have happened at any other port, but it was the Port of New Orleans and its role in international trade that made the case as significant as it was. And out of that case, the Federal Grain Inspection Service was created. Through the various scandals and crises that have flavored Louisiana's grain history, the state has been given a central role in driving change for the industry as a whole. After Continental, facility designs and building materials have changed, and certainly safety and housekeeping are primary concerns for all elevator employees. So not only is Louisiana responsible for a major portion of the country's grain exporting business, it has been largely responsible for numerous changes to how the industry does its work. I think Tim Duncan said it best when he suggested that the grain elevators of Louisiana quite literally feed the world. As early as 1955, the Times of Shreveport commented, today with modern farming methods and technological development, the American farmer is vitally concerned with foreign markets. Free countries of the world too have recognized this interdependence and have counted on foreign trade to help feed the peoples of their lands. Certainly New Orleans found a central place in the system of foreign trade, yet its significance has gone largely unnoticed by the greater American populace and it has been called the best kept secret on the Mississippi. I tend to agree with that brilliant assessment simply because so few people in my department were prepared for the amount of information I uncovered in the last year. Simply because Louisiana is not a wheat producing state, most people do not recognize the relationship the state has to the American and global diet. One historian has even concluded that the grain industry has greatly contributed to the ecological changes of Louisiana, suggesting the impact of this somewhat hidden industry reaches far beyond the agricultural sector and deserves more serious attention. So thank you. That is my master's thesis in a nutshell. Thank you for a great and very informative presentation today, Chandler. This includes the presentation portion of today's event. We will now begin our Q&A session. If you have not yet submitted your questions, please do so at this time. Okay, Chandler, our first question today. What commodity do you believe had the greatest impact on the Louisiana grain processing industry? Um, I draw my answer from one of the oral history interviews, which I believe said uh, that I don't have the transcripts in front of me. So if I get this backwards, my apologies. It's between wheat and corn um, because one of them produces more dust than the other, which I think they said was corn, but I very well could be wrong. Um, I certainly think through what I've been reading recently that wheat has had the most impact in terms of export um, being, you know, the most sought after commodity by our international customers. Um, it changed the diet of Japan for one thing. Um, they didn't really eat bread until the 1960s, post-World War II really. Um, and then of course it sparked the 1972 sales to Russia. So I think really once rice was moved out of New Orleans, it was the wheat from the Midwest that got us started. Okay, great. Our next question, what, or, excuse me, why do you think it is important to have grain elevators? What role do you believe that they play in our larger agricultural system? That seems like a cheating question, because I think that's on my question set for people. <laughs> um, um, so why do I think they're significant? Why should we have them? Um, it's really that middle process in terms of the whole Vogue thing right now is that farm to table aspect. But with grain, that's not really something that the typical consumer is capable of which is why I think it's significant to have those middle ground places. It's just kind of the hidden aspect of it that makes it a complicated history. Um, but I certainly think it develops international relationships as we've seen. And it also um, just allows us access to that farm product. Like clearly when it was just a subsistence crop, there was a way for the individual consumer to process it for what they needed. But I think they, even then, they still needed help from a local flour miller 
or rice miller and that kind of thing. So that's what I see the significance as. Certainly. Okay, our next question. Have you seen sugarcane production impact wheat, corn, and bean production in Louisiana? Um, I haven't really looked into that so much. I know that one of my interviewees made somewhat of a comment in that regard, and it's just struck me as something I hadn't considered, um, is that relationship, because it does start to breed as really um, exclusive, like they've got boundaries things, like the sugar industry is its own little entity and the grain industry is its own little entity. But certainly in this state, they are interconnected in terms of how it uses our land. Um, but no, I haven't really looked into that, so I don't have a good answer for that one. Okay, that is all that we have for questions today. I want to thank everyone for their participation. If you have further questions, feel free to email me at kendall at graynet.com, and we will get your questions forward to our presenter. And that is all that we have for today for our webinar. I would like to thank our sponsors, M&M Specialty Services and VAA LLC for their support in bringing you today's webinar. And I also want to thank Jeeps and our presenter, Chandler Taylor, for joining us today. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available for viewing on graynet.com within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to our recording and our presentation slides. Our next webinar will be held on Thursday, February 21st at 10 a.m. Central Time. Carol Jones will be discussing grain bin safety. Again, I want to thank you all for attending, and I wish you all a great day.